Hey, we're going to continue to talk about storytelling. As folks who tuned in yesterday um, might remember, the theme this year is uh, persuade the persuasive entrepreneur, using the power of storytelling to drive your own narrative, to find customers, to raise money, and to find strategic partners. And I'm really, really pleased uh, that we've had so many supportive sponsors. I want to thank um, the Charles River Chamber, Leader Bank, um, Needham and Company, the Prison Book Program, who I hope you'll all have a chance to learn more about, uh, the Katahdin Group, and of course, Wellesley Books, and our innovators, uh, Harriet of Harlem, One Degree Outside, Fancy Pants Baking Company, End State, The Kendall Project, and Right On Corporation. And I hope all of you will have a chance to interact with them uh, later this morning. Uh, so I'm really, really pleased to talk about uh, storytelling in a noisy world and how we can leverage storytelling to really think about our own journey. And I can't think of uh, better authors, better books this year uh, than the two we're featuring this morning. And so uh, Archie Jones uh, is a uh, lecturer an entrepreneurial, in the Entrepreneurial Management Unit at uh, Harvard Business School. He teaches venture capital, private equity, field global immersion, and scaling minority businesses. He's written a lot, uh, and so I hope you'll uh, learn more about him. He's the founder and CEO of Next Gen Coach Network. Um, he's an <clears throat> advisor at Six Pillar Partners, uh, an investment company, as well as a board of direct, uh, on the board at Corpay, which is listed on the New York Stock Exchange. Um, Jen Toasty Karras is also with us. I'm really, really pleased uh, to see her again. She and I talked earlier uh, uh, in the season for authors and innovators about her terrific book. Uh, she teaches at Babson College, uh, and she teaches researchers and coaches others about what it means to craft a meaningful career and a productive life. How is that uh, for a great academic gig? So I really want to thank uh, both of them for, uh, for joining us. So the two books are Is Your Work Worth It? and The Treasure You Seek. Jen, I'm going to start with you. Uh, we see that recent studies say that barely a third of Americans feel engaged at work. Um, and their happiness is lowest when their power and their achievement is highest. What's going on? Yeah. Um, can you guys hear me? I feel OK. Um, Larry, first of all, thank you so much for doing this and for featuring authors. I was saying to Archie earlier, there was once this idea that sort of writing books was dead. And I'm just so glad in this event attests that that couldn't be further from the truth. And as an author, it's just so meaningful. This is what I study. But what makes my work so meaningful is that people actually care about the ideas and read the books. So thank you, Larry. And thanks to all of you. OK, now on to more depressing statistics, <laughs> like Let's do it. barely one third of Americans being um, engaged at work, and then this study about what we call the U-bend, that our happiness tends to be the greatest when we are very young or very old. So when we're mid-career, middle age, like me, um, and maybe like some of you, uh, our, actually, our earning power should be the greatest. We should be reaching a point of status and influence, and we've sort of earned our position in our careers, and yet we find that we are dissatisfied and sometimes disengaged. So what is going on there? It can be, uh, you know, it's not easily distilled, and it can be a number of things, but I think part of what happens is we get so caught up in um, notions of where we should be, notions of what we should be doing, and maybe lose sight of, and, and frankly, just get so busy. So a lot of us have the, the term sandwich generation is used. We're having kids later. Many people have elder care responsibilities, responsibilities of various kinds, and we're squeezed. There's high um, uh, demands at work. There's high demands maybe outside of work. There's a sense of um, being always too busy and not being able to sort of pick our heads up and ask, you know, why are we doing what we're doing? And so my co-author and I wrote our book in, in part because, and, and I should give my co-author a shout out, Christopher Wong Michelson. He's a business ethics professor at the University of St. Thomas in Minneapolis. And so he's a philosopher by training and I'm an organizational psychologist and we both study the meaning of work. And we realized people work a lot. We know that we work more than ever, 
and even you know COVID was supposed to take away our commutes and give us more work-life balance and it actually did the opposite. And a lot of us are in this work, 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 workaholic culture. So we don't pause to ask why are we doing the work we're doing and is what we're getting from our work worth what we're giving to our work. So our hope is just that simple insight of why are we doing the work we do? What are we looking to get from it? Can help people to feel like, okay, maybe I'm spending a lot of time at work, but I know why that is. I'm sort of reconciling that within my life as a whole. And so the hope is we can sort of close that gap of engagement and satisfaction by knowing what we're there for. Thank you, Jen. A topic that matters. One of the uh, things that I read right after reading Is Your Work Worth It is I picked up Archie's book, and Archie's lived this. So, Archie, tell a bit about the story that led you, as a very accomplished person in a solid job, yeah. kind of what, where you thought you would be, but it wasn't enough. Yeah, it's that, that journey started probably eight years ago. And, and again, Larry, thank you for having me. Great to be here. Great to be sharing books, as you said, with, with any and everyone who will listen. But about eight years ago, again, I'd had a career in private equity. I was serving as a CFO of a fintech company at the time. Um, but got asked a very interesting question along the lines that Jennifer was just talking about of, when was I happiest and most effective? Mm -hmm. And the answer that came back, and actually talked to some folks I had worked with and friends who had known me for a long time, and it said it's when, it, it, it was when Archie was coaching or teaching. Now, again, I'm CFO of a small fintech company, so this is not my day job, not right? Connected. So my day, not right. connected at all. And so what Jennifer was describing is you realize that you're unfulfilled in a certain way. Yeah, you've got a lot of accomplishments, you've got a lot of accolades, but are you really working in that space that really leverages your superpower, which was the next question. And so my superpower, once I realized that it was coaching, well now what are you gonna do about it? Because the reality is that most folks are only doing whatever that superpower is for probably 20% of their time. So yeah, I was coaching Little League and I'd take friends' phone calls to help them with something, so coaching kinda on the side. And I got charged with the question of if you could move that needle, maybe not flip it all the way 80-20 the other way, but if you could just move it closer to 50-50, how much more satisfaction would you get out of that? And so I started on that journey of figuring out what my superpower was, which was coaching. Now how do I apply that? Um, and so that's really what the book was all about, is my own journey of finding my superpower and then living into it. So now I describe myself as a coach. You see that I teach at the Harvard Business School. I dreamed about that, but hadn't actualized it, so I hadn't turned that into an action. Uh, I sit on board. So everything you hear now in my background is some form of coaching. That's the other thing that you figure out is when you figure out what your superpower is, there generally isn't a job description, there isn't a posting in the newspaper for that, to the work point, right? It, there was nobody looking for a coach. Uh, and the type of lifestyle that I wanted to live, coaching Little League wasn't going to pay the bills. Uh, so I had, to, <laughs> I had to find what that really meant. So my advisory work on boards was coaching. Going back and teaching at the Harvard Business School, I, I graduated from there as well, but to go back and teach at the Harvard Business School was coaching. And so I then crafted a life around, around that superpower, and I wrote the book to try and help others on that journey, either unrealized leaders or unfulfilled leaders who really want to lean into what they should be doing or could be doing to kind of live their life at the optimal. Yeah, I, I, I love that both of you are, tr are at that intersection that Frederick Buechner called where your great joy meets the world's great need. Yeah. Uh, Howard Thurman at BU called it the sound of the genuine. What's, the, what's your sound? Um, Jen, you say that we've got this uniquely American mindset where we categorize what people do as jobs, pay the rent, right. career, and then ultimately the sound of the genuine, the calling, which, which Archie uh, says to everyone, you've got this superpower. So can you talk a bit, I'd like both of you to talk a bit about that characterization, that mindset, and for folks in the, um, in the audience, I want you to speak to two of them. Folks who might just be starting, and then accomplished leaders who've been in their position for a couple of years. How do they sort out job, career, and calling? Yeah, thanks Larry. So um, in, in the US in particular, we are obsessed with what you do for a living is who you are. 
When we meet someone at a party, we say, what do you do? And we know what that means. That does not mean, like, what do I do in my free time? It means, what do you do at work? And that's so definitional to how we see people. So this notion of our work choices have these consequences, both because, as I said, we spend a lot of time at work, we give a lot of ourselves to our work, most of us, but also it says something to to other people. But in terms of job, career, and calling, and I learned about this distinction from my advisor when I was in grad school, um, Amy Rosneski, who's now a Wharton professor, uh, just this notion that we can work for money primarily, for career advancement, or for, for fulfillment from the work itself. And I think partly because in the US we do work so hard and work is so central, there's this sort of uh, dominant cultural narrative that work should be a calling. If we're spending so much time doing it, we should love it. We should feel that it fulfills us. It should make the world a better place, you know, all these kinds of things. And I love, Archie, you said something like, um, I love Little League, but it's not gonna fulfill my lifestyle. And I tell students, it's okay to work for money, actually, as long as you know why you're working. So my students graduating Babson, they have, like many people, loans to pay. They'd love to buy a house one day. How do you do that in the greater Boston area um, or whatever you know, desirable city they're going to, to move to? So even though I think we often privilege work as a calling in terms of telling people their work should be a calling if it's worth doing, In the book, we're very agnostic that you can work for, um, and I think at different points, Hilary, you mentioned the career trajectory, early, middle, late. Um, At different times, I think it shifts why we're working. Does work feel more like a job, career, or calling? So for those just starting out, again, totally fine to prioritize the money over the meaning. Ideally, you'd have both, right? But... What I would love and and what I tell students is just to be intentional Mm. about what, why am I doing what I'm doing and to check in. So if I'm, if the money's important to me, am I getting paid fairly? Mm. Are my efforts being recognized? Um, If I'm in it for the meaning, am I potentially being exploited? Are they asking me to come in all the time because they know I won't say no because I'm the dedicated person? And then I think for your leader question, and I want, I want Archie to weigh in, but um, I think for your, if I'm, if I'm leading an organization, if I'm a little further on in my career, uh, you want to think about this in terms of your employees. They have these different reasons they're there. Some of them may feel that job is their life. It is their fulfillment. And others, and you know, I think the stereotypes are somewhat true. I'm hearing from my students a lot. They don't want to live to work they want to work to live. They're questioning and pushing back against hustle culture, burnout culture, and overwork. So, you know, don't assume that everyone has the same, you know, work meaning that you do or that you did when you were their age. And, you know, to really be aware of these multitudes of work meanings and to sort of check in with those. It flips a little bit for you. Are your employees, are those you're leading getting what they want from their work? And, and Archie, I'm going to have you answer the same question, but I also want you to lean in uh, f- with this terrific title, where it came from, because I love that story. Yeah, so the, the quote that inspired the title of the book is, uh, the cave you fear to enter holds the treasure you seek. And so what that speaks to is the juxtaposition of confidence and fear, right? That cave, that, that cave that holds you back from going after that high purpose, deep meaning job that you're talking about or work that you're talking about, usually what's holding you back from doing that is the cave, that fear of, you know, for me, one of my caves was the book itself. The treasure for me was coaching more broadly. I wasn't excited about the idea of writing a book, um, sharing my own personal stories and journeys. Um, I even had doubt about the fact that, again, uh, Jennifer is a PhD in OB, I don't have a PhD in leadership. I'm just telling my own leadership journey. And so there was a fear that, am I good enough to be able to write a book about something that I haven't studied or earned a degree for? Am I certified? And so this idea that the fear is holding you back, and I think it ties directly to your question, for young leaders that you were describing, there's the building of that confidence to go after your dream. But you also have, got to, you also have to start with, and I call it a BHAG, I didn't coin that, but the big, hairy, audacious goal 
Jim Collins talked about it at a corporate level. This, what is the, the big thing that you're going after? That almost unreachable thing. I think you've got to start there and figure out and tap into that with our young people, our young leaders, because that will be your guidepost for some of these shorter decisions, these short-term and medium-term decisions. So it's okay, to your point, I tell students all the time, it's great for you to go and if you've got the big, hairy, audacious goal to be an entrepreneur, but your first job needs to be something different, whether it's to pay the bills or to pick up some additional skills, that's fine, but you always have your eye towards that North Star that we're talking about there. And so setting that BHAG out there so that it makes even the, the work that you're talking about, even in those tough days, um, feel a little bit lighter because I know I'm working for a bigger purpose than just my paycheck for today. For my senior leaders who are operating now, I think you still got the confidence, the confidence to enter a new sphere, right? You've gotten to a level of comfort. You've gotten to a level of success. Now I'm going to change what that looks like. I, I was telling you, I told you about my own personal story. All of a sudden, I'm going to be a coach. You know, my whole identity is I'm a finance professional. I'm either a CFO or a private equity guy. Now all of a sudden, I'm going to be a coach. And so this idea of walking into that cave, but the treasure on the other side is sharing that story with other folks and inspiring those leaders to go forward. And I think for each of us, as you identify what that cave is, you'll get, and you know what the BHAG is on the other side, it makes it worth going through that cave. I really appreciate how you started um, when you look at a leader and say, you have capital. And you talk about five C's. I'm not going to ruin the book. <laughs> but uh, with, with Jen, so these are books that will stay with you. You can read a chapter at a time, and they stay with you. And in fact, they're better read and savored, uh, in, in my view, because you do, you do talk about that. Archie, talk a little bit about the five C's. Sure. I don't want to give too much away, because we want sure. folks to get the book. But five C's, you look at a student, you look at a leader, and you say, you got to do five things. you got to think about this in five ways. And it's all about, I'll start with the last C, and I'll, so I'll bring it all the way around the circle. You imagine in your mind five Cs working around the circle. What I just started talking about was confidence, right? You're talking about building confidence. And, and a wonderful leader uh, who was visiting class the other day said, confidence attracts capital. Now, we generally talk about capital in financial capital or experiential capital, so lessons and opportunities, or social capital access to other folks. I think leadership capital is the foundation that, that attracts all, th all three of those other forms and multiplies them as well. And so over the course of many, many, many office hours with students, I developed a framework to take them through because there was a similar theme of what they needed in order to build their confidence. And I think it's certainly true outside of the classroom as well. Those five C's are capability I talked about. So knowing what your superpower is, that you bring something special to the table, culture, Leveraging all of your history, all of your journey thus far as an asset to bring forward. Communication, which is actually a two-parter. The story you tell yourself, and then the story that you tell the outside world. Those first three, that capability, um, capability, culture, and first set of communication, all are an internal journey. You're working on yourself right. before you take communication outside. So, to, so communication being the third C, going then to connection. How are you going to work your network? How are you going to develop a network? You can't do that without having an sto internal story that matches the exter external story and brings you all the way back around to confidence. And that's this journey that I take you through in the book. There's exercises in there. I take you through my story and an amalgamated story of a number of my students on building that confidence. And almost every leader that I work with, if they're not getting to where they're trying to get to, something's out of, work, out of sorts in one of those Cs or a couple of those Cs. And so you can go to work on a few of those uh, as you develop your leadership capital and move towards your goal. I love that you start this from the same premise, both of you, uh, which is to see, it, it, it's what our, one of our authors, Nia Sangwan, who's written in a great book last year, this time uh, as well, talks about me, we, and the community, mm -hmm. those, those kind of circles. And both of you make it safe to have that conversation at all levels, which is new. Um, and Jen, you do it through um, a searing lens. You went back and looked at the portraits of grief, the section in the New York Times that listed all of the folks who were killed 9-11. Mm. 
And you looked at everyone, the folks who were waiting tables as their third or fourth job, and you dug in. Can you talk a little bit about what you wanted to convey with that lens? Yeah, so I want to give, again, my co-author, Christopher, a shout out for having the really brilliant idea. So as academics, we're always looking for you know, novel data sources or data that sheds light on the meaning of work through an unexpected lens. And when we talk about the portrait of grief, portraits of grief, talk about an unexpected lens. I mean, this was the New York Times attempt to systematically memorialize the victims of 9-11. In doing so, they actually created sort of this new journalistic form that now when we have, unfortunately, a mass tragedy or mass casualties, they're not full obituaries, but they're these brief, like almost impressionistic sketches they've been described as mm. of the, the deceased people's lives. And it's through the eyes of those who knew them best. So they interview you know, spouses, children, coworkers, um, parents in some cases. And because so many of the 9-11 victims were in the World Trade Center and died while they were at work, tragically, the two biggest occupational groups were financiers. So a lot of the high, high floors of the Trade Center were um, trading firms but also first responders, of course, that makes sense, the firefighters and police officers who were there that day to help. Um, we thought it provided a lens to understand through the eyes of the people who love, you know, the loved ones of the people who died that day, how was their work remembered? And again, we looked at this lens of was that work a job, a career, or a calling? And no surprise, we found an oversampling of callings and especially among, we might, we might anticipate this, um, the first responders. So that's heroic work yeah. that many of us go into um, to, to specifically to help the world, to help others. And we know that a risk that we undertake is that we could die on the job, that we don't focus on that necessarily when we, when we go into that work. Um, but for, I think, one of the things that we found that was so profound was that although we might, um, in our society, lionize or celebrate heroic professions and callings as we should. We found, and Larry had mentioned, you know, uh, someone working in the restaurant at the, the Windows on the World or someone who was a, a delivery person for a restaurant, not an occupation that we necessarily glorify, but in the eyes of the loved ones left behind, that work was elevated. So there's a specific um, delivery boy who was profiled whose family back in Mexico saw him as a hardworking adventurer who sent home his earnings to help the family build a, build a house. So this notion that we, our work has these implications that are far beyond us. And whenever folks are asking me, you know, I've kind of lost sight of the meaning of my work. How can I find it? Mm. I say, what does it mean to others? Who's the ultimate beneficiary of the work you do? And if you're working for money, maybe it is your family, maybe it is your, your loved ones, or maybe it is those who interact with you and something you enjoy doing outside of work. Um, you know, sometimes, again, we're so busy, we lose sight of that ultimate why. And although these are very hard to read, these portraits of grief, and it's sort of not, you know, it's a, it's a difficult material to think about, I think there's something revealing about um, our legacy, so how our work is remembered in the eyes of others, and just thinking about, you know, we, we don't want to think about dying, of course, none of us want to, but uh, what, what might that legacy be, and what, what might our work mean to those who we care about most? And, and it's a conversation starter, for the CEOs or leaders in the audience, um, Archie, I was like, I really, why do I need this? Why do I need this for my team? Why do I need this for myself? I've got payroll to make. I've got <laughs> a job to do. This feels like a luxury. And you would say to that CEO or leader? I would say it's more than a luxury. It's a necessity. Um, I think there's a, we talk a lot about it, and I teach in the entrepreneurial management unit at HBS or Harvard Business School. And so, but I take the broad definition of entrepreneurship, which includes intrapreneurship. Ah. And so even those folks Makes inside sense. of organizations, I mean, imagine if your in entire workforce actually were at work excited about what they were doing. Again, think about what I described to you in the last question. Someone who's there, who knows what they're there for, excited about what they're getting from their work. Right 
happy to be there because not only are they getting a paycheck, mm -hmm. but they're moving towards whatever their BHAG is. A big part of my being, my professional career was really that entrepreneurship. I, had folk, I was inside of organizations and asking them to do more, trying to do my boss's job because I was trying to get more out of that, that work. I was trying to leverage those skills and get those skills. And so for the CEOs and leaders in the room, if you had a, an employee base or a staff that was excited to be there, not just to help the company, but they were also, because I believe in also in this enlightened self-interest, Right, they've got to be there doing it for themselves. That's where you're going to get the extra hours of work. That's how they got the extra hours of work out of me, because there was something in it for me. It wasn't just to keep my boss happy. And so I think that that culture, right? I talked about culture on the individual basis, but inside of an organization, you can take those same five C's, but culture would be at the center of it. And driving that strong culture where everybody's leaning into their superpower and bringing their superpower to work and wanting to exercise it. Think about what a powerful organization that would be. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking we got a couple of good books for retreats. <laughs> Jen, um, a CEO, a leader who says, why would I read this? Why do I need this? Yeah, I, I, I'll echo what Archie said. I mean, I think if you're not asking the question about why employees are showing up to work every day at your organization, you're really missing a big piece of why employees would, would stay. And I think in a world where we have a war for talent, in a world where we can't just assume that everyone sees a forever career, um, you can lose some, some people who are really valuable assets at the organization. So um, I think understanding, and, and the part that I, I sometimes worry about is I sometimes worry that when people hear that I study the meaning of work, they're going to try to ask me, well, how can I sort of give employees the illusion that their work matters? It's almost like the meaningful <laughs> work do, right? greenwashing, right? right? Like, of course the work is making the world a better place, right? But um, again, right, not about assuming a one-size-fits-all about why each employee is there, but I think the more that you can provide opportunity, I mean, I love the idea of retreats where they read our books, of course, right? Right? But um, I think the more that you can show employees that you, un you care about understanding their why, then you show employees that you care about understanding their life, life path and how the work fits into that. And I just think you can retain them over a longer period of time. And, and again, I, maybe the employees who aren't asking why also aren't the employees that you want That's for the right. reasons that Archie said. That's right. uh, lots of echoes for folks who attended last night for our, our book, Job Moves. Uh, last night where our, our authors talked about this very topic. So you can see that this year at Authors and Innovators, we're leaning into that. Um, Jen and Archie, I want to know what authors and or innovators are inspiring you. What are you reading? What are you following? What's interesting to you these days? Jen, I'll start with you. Okay, so the book that I just picked up that, and I'm sorry that I'm going to identify uh, or appeal to like half our audience, but for my <laughs> fellow ladies in the, in the audience, um, Alison Fergale's book, Likeable Badass. The title says <laughs> it all. The title, oh, right? the title says it all. Mic drop, that's it. Um, she is a professor of OB at UNC, um, University of North Carolina Business School. She just published this book, Likeable Badass, and it's all about how do women navigate this, you know, double bind of being competent and the badass side with the um, need to be still seen as being warm and likable. And it's a, she's a fabulous researcher. The book is based, as my book is, in research as well as real people's stories. And it's just a great read. And I think, um, I, I, you know, it's something that I'm thinking about a lot. Okay. Archie. I'm reading Love and Whiskey. Okay. Do I need to I'm say liking more? these titles. <laughs> I'm liking these titles. <laughs> Two great things, at least in my opinion. Um, the book is by Fawn Weaver, and the, you, you opened up talking about storytelling. She is one of the greatest storytellers. She is telling the story in the book of Nearest Green, who actually taught Jack Daniels, black man, African-American man, who taught Jack Daniels how to make whiskey. Wow. Uh, whose story is That's little cool known book. and has formulated a company, a great brand, uh, Uncle Nearest, around that, uh, and now has a company that's valued at a billion dollars. And so it tells 
her story of building the company while also honoring the culture and the legacy of Nearest Green. It's just a wonderful wow. dual journey uh, told by a wonderful storyteller. I love that. And I love these. So uh, the books are The Treasure You Seek, Is Your Work Worth It? Uh, Jen Karras, Archie Jones, thank you so much.